Uh, but I want to tell you uh, some of uh, the extraordinary, uh, Joshua had no part in this slide except uh, being the subject of the picture, uh, <coughs> Uh, the extraordinarily elegant and exciting work which he's done on the way in which unconscious moral judgments, judgments which the agent may in fact explicitly reject, can nonetheless have a significant impact on a range of morally relevant intuitions. So, let, uh, uh, yes, uh, a bit of background here. Uh, let me fit this into a broader movement. Uh, so Gary uh, Marcus, uh, in his uh, <clears throat> uh, just about to be finished book called Kluge, uh, argues that uh, more recently involved, computationally slow, computa uh, consciously accessible mental processes, the things that uh, in the trendy literature are called System 2 processes, were grafted onto older System 1 psychological systems that were designed for a very different purpose. Uh, and the kludgy architecture that results, uh, right? You've got one kind of architecture uh, <clears throat> there and in place, and you somehow got to build the other one on top of it. Uh, Marcus argues accounts for many of the quirks and shortcomings that we find in, for example, the heuristics and biases literature, some of the perception literature, and elsewhere. And before I go on, since somebody's likely to notice it, uh, I should say that uh, <clears throat> I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Gary, except on one point. Indeed, we're thinking of doing a joint uh, uh, BBS article together uh, on this stuff. Uh, the one point we cannot reach agreement on is he insists on misspelling Kluge. That way, uh, <clears throat> all right-thinking people should know that Kluge has a D in it. All right. Well, I think Joshua's work uh, provides an important and disquieting illustration of this phenomenon in the moral domain. Let me get you up to speed uh, by telling you, first of all, uh, about uh, a finding uh, that Joshua reported, what, about five years ago now, uh, that has become known in the literature uh, as the side effect effect or the nob effect. Okay? What he reports, uh, I guess 2003, so four years ago, uh, is an experiment in which participants were presented with a pair of almost identical vignettes. Uh, and I know many people know this work because it has been so influential. But here are the two vignettes, uh, uh, one in red, the other in blue on the same screen. The vice president of the company went to the chairman of the board and said, we're thinking of starting a new program. It'll help us increase profits, but it will also harm, one version, help, the other version, the environment. The chairman of the board answered, I don't care at all about harming, helping the environment. I just want to make as much profit as I can. Let's start the new program. They started the new program. Sure enough, the environment was harmed or helped. In the harm case, participants were asked how much blame the chairman deserved on a Likert scale of 0 to 6, and whether he intentionally harmed the environment. In the help case, participants were asked how much praise the chairman deserved, same scale, and whether he intentionally helped the environment. Uh, the astounding, dramatic results are, in the harm case, 82% said the chairman brought about the side effect intentionally. In the help case, 77% said the chairman did not bring about uh, the side effect intentionally. Well, Joshua's initial hypothesis about this, a very influential hypothesis, uh, was that people's moral assessments of the side effect here uh, play a substantial role in determining whether they're willing to say that the side effect was brought about intentionally. A judgment that the side effect is morally bad makes it more likely that it will be judged intentional. Now, if that's true, just as stated, uh, it's itself very disquieting because it flies in the face of the traditional wisdom uh, that judgments about whether somebody did something intentionally are, as it were, folk scientific judgments. They're judgments about fact, not judgments uh, <clears throat> with regard to value. But if that were true, it at least has a sort of obvious rationale since these judgments about whether an action is intentional play a central role in determining whether an agent deserves praise or blame. But more recent research uh, has showed that uh, if we interpret the hypothesis in the most natural way as making a claim about the effect of moral judgment of the kinds of moral judgments that people consciously make and endorse, then the hypothesis, the original Loeb hypothesis, is simply mistaken. 
The problem emerges, I think, very cleanly uh, in a study done by David Pizarro and Paul Bloom in conjunction with Joshua. So uh, <clears throat> just um, indicating, again, the nicely collaborative nature of work in this area uh, that even people who refute you collaborate with you. All right, uh, so this study was done on uh, liberal university students who were given Nob-style vignettes looking at the um, uh, intentionality of side effects. Uh, uh, you know, I won't give you the whole story, uh, but an advertising executive approves an ad campaign, ad campaign which has either the side effect of encouraging interracial sex or encouraging placing gardenias in one's office. Okay? Well, none of the participants in this study judged that interracial sex was morally wrong, and you'll be relieved to know that none of them thought placing gardenias in their office was morally wrong either. Nonetheless, the participants were much more inclined to say that the executive intentionally encouraged interracial sex uh, than uh, <clears throat> that he intentionally encouraged gardenia placing. So it looks like explicit moral judgments can't explain the difference in judgments about intentionality of side effects. But uh, <clears throat> following Pizarro and Bloom, uh, Joshua has recently proposed uh, that perhaps participants are making non-conscious normative judgments of a very special sort here. Uh, <clears throat> that the behavior in question violates a norm, a norm that's made salient by the question or situation, even if it's a norm now, they know it is a norm, it's a norm existing somewhere, or it can be articulated as a norm, or maybe even it's a norm for some people in their culture, even if it's a norm that they explicitly reject. So the picture that Joshua has now been proposing in the last year or so, a uh, year and a half, looks like this. In reaching a conscious moral judgment, we can consider a variety of different moral norms, weigh the norms against each other, and perhaps even determine that some of the norms are themselves unjustified and shouldn't be taken into account at all. The non-conscious moral judgments are, <clears throat> are formed through a much simpler, a sort of system one style automatic process. They're formed extremely quickly and involve very shallow processing. And in generating a non-conscious moral judgment, the only norms we consider are the ones that come first to mind, typically ones generated by, evoked by, uh, the scenario itself. We don't search for additional norms. We don't weigh the norms against one another. Uh, we don't uh, ask whether any of the norms that are being effective in this process are, are uh, justified or unjustified. Instead, we simply, on this picture, determine whether the behavior in question violates any of the norms in the very limited set of norms we're considering. And if it does, we classify it as a transgression. This is intended as a technical term. We classify it, uh, we mark it in a certain way. Uh, and it's uh, that classification as a transgression uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> then influences our intuitions about intentional action. Okay? So that's the picture, this system one process that says, does it fly in the face of any norm that this uh, scenario or this vignette brought to mind? Uh, <clears throat> if so, that influences our uh, judgments about intentional action. Well, notice the theory predicts that, most salient, uh, uh, <clears throat> that the most salient norms evoked by a given case will be the ones used in making intentionality judgments, even if subsequent reflection leads the agent to think there's nothing wrong with violating the norm or maybe even that violating that norm would be a very good thing to do. And here's one vignette that Joshua has recently used uh, to test this idea. Uh, <clears throat> in Nazi Germany, there was a law called the Racial Identification Law. The purpose of the law was to help identify people of certain races so they could be rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Shortly after this law was passed, the CEO of a small corporation decided to make a certain, orga certain organizational changes. The vice president of the corporation said, by mo making those changes, you'll definitely be increasing our profits, but you'll be violating, or in the other case, of course, fulfilling, the requirements of the racial identification law. The CEO said, look, 
I know that I'll be violating, fulfilling uh, the requirements of the law, but I don't care one bit about that. All I care about is making as much profit as I can. Let's make those organizational changes. As soon as the CEO gave this order, the corporation began making the organizational changes. Well, in this study, 81% of the subjects uh, in the violate condition said he violated the requirements intentionally, whereas only 30% uh, in the fulfilled condition said he fulfilled the requirements intentionally. Well, <clears throat> what to say about all of this? Uh, this theory I've just sketched for you um, is certainly, and Joshua wouldn't suggest this for a moment, of course, it's certainly not the last word on how intentionality judgments are generated. Uh, this work has inspired dozens of other researchers. Uh, there are many studies I haven't told you about already in the literature, and many others are underway as we speak. But if Joshua's theory is on the right track, then intentionality judgments, notice, are produced, they're the product of a kludgy architecture, which can be influenced by norms and judgments which the agent first of all, is not even aware are influencing her decisions, and secondly, the agent doesn't even endorse. Indeed, in some cases, like presumably the racial identification case, uh, the agent explicitly rejects them. 